Alright, well here it is. There's super means everywhere in here too. There's a terminal here. Museum of Technology, Employee Terminal. Log entry 2076, 0202. Can someone please fix the planetarium projection system? The automated system that was just installed is prone to malfunctions at least once a week. We've had to interrupt the programming more times than I care to remember, and end up taking over manually. I suggest we remove the system and bring back the human elements so the audience will feel more engaged. B. Bell, Research Lead. 2076, 0211. I'd like to lodge a formal complaint regarding the firearms exhibition that's planned for a temporary display in the atrium. With the world tensions the way they are right now, I feel it's highly inappropriate to glorify these killing devices by promoting them as a tourist attraction. If this is some sort of patriotic gesture, then it's entirely lost upon me and I urge you to rethink this decision. B. Bell, Research Lead. Wow, I like the way this guy thinks. 2076, 0307. This is just a quick rundown of acquisitions we've been awarded for 2078. If any of these interest you, please stop by and see me so we can discuss it or submit a standard research request before the cutoff date. All submissions must be made by October 2nd, 2077, so now is the time to get them in. Supersonic Airliner Zack's Computer Prototype Original Model T-45D Power Armor Suit Laser Pistol Prototype B-Bell Research Lead 2076 1010 our new addition to the spaceflight gallery, the Virgo 2 Lunar Lander, is now open to the general public and ready for viewing. I want to extend a hearty thank you and job well done to the entire research and restoration team for pulling that pile of junk out of mothballs and putting it in such fine shape. Many sleepless nights were spent on this project, and a small token of our thanks, you will find a substantial bonus in your next paycheck. Give each other a pat on the back. You've earned it. Be Bell. Research Lead Oh, that's the Lunar Lander I'm looking for! Huh, it was kind of nice of them to give them such a bonus. 2077, 0103. The virus that has been plaguing our archetype model FF06 mainframe due to an unknown attack has finally been localized by our research team and identified. After a complete clamp on the mainframe's core, I am happy to announce that the infection has been removed. The soul of this machine has improved. B. Bell, Research Lead. <sighs> Alright, gotta go find that lunar lander. We are sorry to inform our visitors that this area is not available yet. We apologize for the inconvenience. Check back soon. Oh, this place gives this me the claim. Finish. I could still come in here. Whoa, what is this? Literature of tomorrow. Huh. Oh, these are all the books I've been finding in the wasteland. A great resource for any readers interested in the wonders of science, from astronomy to biology, from aeronautics to chemistry. Big Book of Science will teach you everything there is to know about the unseen forces and knowledge that rule our daily lives. Big Book of Science Extract Chapter 425, Computer Science Technology is amazing. Now it only takes a couple of seconds to do enormous calculations, such as multiplying two five-digit numbers or higher. Even if you do not aspire to be a grandmaster mathematician or computer expert, you will still benefit tremendously by acquiring basic skills and knowledge in this field for daily usage. Computer science is the study of computation and its applications. This includes the acquisition, storage, and access to information. In this chapter, we will focus on information encoded in bits and bytes in a computer memory and the designs of com computational systems. Subchapter 1.1.1.1.1 Safety First before we delve into the depths of computer knowledge, we will offer some advice to keep you and your family safe from computers' dangers. Inside and out. How could a computer be unsafe, you may ask? Oh, you'd be surprised. Section 1.1.1.1, Physical Safety. Something you must always keep in mind is to not touch computers or any electrical appliances with your wet hands. Water will increase your conductivity up to the point where you might suffer a lethal electrical shock. 
you must make sure your equipment has plenty of space around them for ventilation, as overheating can damage gadgets beyond repair. Be careful about cables. If placed in high traffic areas around the house, they can pose a potential tripping hazard. It is always a good idea to hire qualified licensed electricians to check the safety standards of your home and make any suggested changes. Section 1.1.1.2 Informatic Safety you should always keep your operating system up to date to keep up with the latest safety measures. Contact your computer manufacturer for more information. Only open messages from people you know. Suspicious attachments may be veiled attempts at stealing your passwords. If you are still uncertain, confirm the message with your contacts through the phone or in person. Turn off your computer. You may feel that it takes too long for it to start up when you are in a hurry, but leaving it on for too long can render it susceptible. Besides, it saves money on your electricity bill. Subsection 1.1.1.2.A Passwords and Hacking Dangers You should always choose a good password to protect your computer. A simple password such as ABCDE may be easy to remember, but is also very easy for a hacker to guess. Avoid using your month of birth, the name of someone close to you, or other personal information. A hacker will have to go through a quite lengthy process in order to hack a computer. They will be presented with a screen full of seemingly random characters, interposed with words the same character length as your chosen password. One of the words will always be the correct password, and this is what the hacker is after. If they select matching brackets on the same line, even with other characters in between, the system may remove one of the fake passwords or reset the number of remaining guesses so they can keep trying. The brackets must be of the same type and on the same line. If they do not guess correctly, the terminal will tell them that the amount of correct letters they guessed, and they will keep trying until they either crack the password or they are locked out, usually after failing four times. If they manage to get in, they will have complete freedom to do as they wish with your information and files. So remember, do not use easy passwords, change them frequently, and keep different ones for different computers for maximum safety. Be mindful of your passwords, give them to no one. Oh, well, I, I know how to hack, I'm actually pretty good at it, but turns out even they knew about that vulnerability and just kinda never got around to fixing it. A translated version of a book coming all the way from the land of dragons and emperors. Chinese Army's Special Ops Training Manual details how covert soldiers learn to be as silent as shadows when dealing with their enemies. Chinese Army Special Ops Training Manual Extract When a soldier of the Glorious People's Liberation Army must engage an enemy, he may do it in several ways. He may go face to face with the honorable foe and fight as boldly as the sea waves crash against the shore. Or he may go with a silent approach, sliding in the shadows like a viper and striking when the honorable opponent has let his guard down. Whether the object be to destroy an enemy settlement, to obtain useful information, or simply to scout unknown terrain, it is always necessary to begin by stepping around lightly, like the stork when hunting for prey, avoiding noisy sticks or traps meant to warn the foe of the soldier's presence. Heavy equipment, despite offering reliable protection, will cause the soldier's footsteps to be louder. Shed those cumbersome clothes, or move slow and steady, like the wind in the mountains, because on that depends a soldier's ability to move unseen. The soldier may be worried, may be sad, may be lonely, but while approaching the enemy quietly, the soldier must not sing, hum, or play music. Opponents who hear the music will be altered, but those who hear not the music think the foe is not there. Just as water, which carries a boat from bank to bank, may also be mean the means of sinking it, so re reliance on stealth, while production of great results, is oftentimes the cause of utter destruction when the enemies notice the soldier's presence. They will assume the soldier has dishonorable intentions, and most likely attack on the spot. Once the soldier is confident the foe has not been made aware of his presence, he may finally strike, and thus he will be guaranteed to deal critical damage. He will win who, prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared. Hmm, it's interesting to read a book from the Chinese perspective. We really could do with learning more about stealth. The DC Journal of Internal Medicine is the most complete and unabridged medical guide that has been made available to the public. Need first aid? Wondering what amazing new discoveries about the human body have swept the experts off their feet? Read on. DC Journal of Internal Medicine Extract Chapter 2. Basics of Healing have you ever cut yourself maybe while cooking or going on a walk and noticed that a couple of hours, maybe even minutes later, the wound has stopped bleeding, has begun to heal on its own? How does that work, and what steps can you take to make the process faster and easier? The moment you tear blood vessels, your body will begin a complex process that starts with reducing bleeding. First comes vasoconstriction, tightening the injured arteries, capillaries, and or veins to reduce the blood flow. 
Next, the enzymes that have leaked from the torn blood vessels will trigger platelets and the plasma protein fibrinogen to gather together at the ends, effectively making a plug. This is called primary hemostasis. And finally, clotting proteins in the blood will form fibrin strands that strengthen the platelet plug and begin coagulation. Eventually, the bleeding will stop, and the plug will become a scab that will eventually be discarded by the body. So what can you do if your body is having trouble dealing with injuries? Subchapter 1, Essentials of First Aid. We recommend you bookmark this page for easy access in case of emergency. If the bleeding does not stop, apply gentle, continuous pressure at the clean cloth, keeping it pressed for 20 to 30 minutes. If possible, keep the area elevated. Once you are certain the bleeding has stopped, clean the wound itself with clear water to reduce the risk of infection and tetanus. If you must use soap, keep it out of the actual wound to avoid irritation. Chemical cleansers are not needed, but you may apply a thin layer of antibiotic ointment to keep the skin moist. Carefully cover the wound with clean bandages and change them at least daily, or whenever they become stained. Once the injury has healed enough to make infection unlikely, leave it exposed to the air to speed recovery. Remember, see your doctor if the wound is more than a quarter of inch 6 millimeters deep, is gaping or has jagged edges, has fat or muscle protruding, isn't healing, or if you notice any redness, increasing pain, drainage, uncomfortable warmth, or swelling. Proper care of any injury as soon as possible reduces the risk of infection or permanent damage. Well, this is useful information. I'm used to having a doctor myself anyway. Young Dean, the pseudonym of retired engineer and nationwide famous electronics expert Del Conifer, writes a monthly magazine with a great maintenance tips for keeping your household appliances in tip-top shape. Dean's Electronic Extract Repairing Home Appliances, Part 3, Learn How to Solder Soldering sounds like a scary process, but in reality, as long as you are careful, it is extremely useful in a large variety of circumstances. It allows you to join metal items together by applying heat along with special metallic alloys and allowing them to cool. Unlike glue, which forms a solely physical adhesive bond, soldering results in a permanent electrical and mechanical connection between metals. If you decide to repair your household appliance and it requires soldering of appliance parts, you will need to follow several simple but important steps. First, you must make sure you are knowledgeable on soldering safety. Check last month's issue for a handy guide. How to handle a soldering iron, that you have a proper surface to perform the task, and that you of course have the parts you need. Many times you will find yourself in need of small parts that may not be readily available. You could of course just go out and buy a new appliance and forget about the whole thing, but what if that isn't an option? What can you do in this case? It will be time to roll up your sleeves and try to get some repairs done. Feel free to check the list of reliable parts stores we have included at the end of the article, or just rummage around at home. Have an old gizmo that you do not use anymore? Maybe some gadget that broke years ago but you couldn't bring yourself to bring it to the junkyard. Crack that sucker open and poke around, you may find just what you need. Of course, you can often avoid soldering altogether if you're just replacing simple parts. But if you're not sure, you may want to consider calling a repair technician. Only attempt repairs you are confident about. Now the tools of the trade. A basic set of precision hand tools will be all you need to work on most appliances. These do not need to be really expensive, but poor quality tools can be worse than useless and can cause irreparable damage. You should keep some straight blade screwdrivers, socket drivers, open end or adjustable wrenches of various sizes, needle nose pliers, wire cutters, tweezers, and dental picks in a toolbox in case you may need to fix something in a hurry. You should also keep a pair of safety glasses. Come back next month to tackle your first soldering project. Oh wow, this is good information to perform repairs. A heartwarming tale written by retired Commander Anaximander Shepard, recounting his life as a novice soldier on the front line of World War II, where he saw his friends and enemies die from explosions, grenades, and mines every single day. That sounds awful. Duck and cover extract. I remember the whole day as if it had been yesterday. That absolute idiot Vega had been flaunting during Chow how he was able to catch grenades in midair and toss them back at the enemy. Of course, you'd have to be brain dead to think that guy was telling the truth. The alarms went off as we were asses and elbows during field day. I grabbed my thumper, a bag of 40 by 46 millimeter grenades, and followed the others as we heard screaming coming from the showers. We realized before long that those 
monsters had come to attack us at our own base. The nerve. The commander came running and we got in position. I knelt down behind the strip truck we had been trying to repair the previous day and prepared myself, but then I heard beeping and noticed in horror that a frag grenade had been left under the engine. Or it would have been. The idiots didn't take the time to check if the truck even had fuel in it. Before I knew what was I was doing, I reached out and disarmed it, then tossed it into my bag. Once I made sure it was safe, I loaded my M79 as quickly as I could, although I dropped my, the ammo several times as my hands were shaking badly. I slapped myself mentally, held my breath, and aimed. I cursed at the fact that the thing didn't have a scope, for I had a lot of trouble trying to distinguish allies from foes in the rush. I saw the youngsters that had been showering at the time of the attack running around naked, limbs hanging at their sides, barely held together by strings of flesh. I recognized one of the cooks, his body hanging limply from a tree, blown apart by an explosion. I tilted my thumb for a bit and launched a shot that was followed by horrible screams in another language that told me I had hit the target. I signaled my companions, and then I saw Vega run forward. Time seemed to slow to a crawl. I exchanged glances with the others who had been present while he boasted at chow time, some of them badly injured, and they seemed to know what I was thinking. I saw the grenade fly through the air before anybody else did. I recognized the stick grenade immediately. I knew those long handles significantly improved the throwing distance. Vega simply reached out and grabbed it, then he turned around and smiled at us, holding it up in the air like a torch. I think the commander was screaming something at him as he lunged forward, but we never heard a thing. For the falling explosion was deafening, and it shook our whole base to its foundations. I woke up among the rubble, crawled out slowly once I realized I had broken my arm, and looked for any survivors. We were unable to find any remains of either Vega or the commander, and I learned just how far you need to stand from a live grenade in order to survive. Wow. War is hell. Sounds like World War II was really bloody. Kind of. Like now. Grognak the Barbarian is an all-time American favorite series of comic books, depicting the adventures of Prince Grognak as he struggles to defend his kingdom from the evil wizard Krosala and his minions. Grognak the Barbarian Extract This is a novelization of issue 14 in The Lair of the Virgin Eater. You will not get away with this, exclaimed Bethesda, her long golden tresses falling over her shoulders as her bright blue eyes brimmed with unspilled tears. Grognak will come and he will destroy you. Ventureth laughed, his scaly serpent body twisting as his black wings flapped, keeping his torso upright. His sharp beak and yellow eyes looked menacing as his shrill laughter pierced Bethesda's ears. You may think so, but you'd be wrong. We are hidden in the highest mountains of the kingdom. If he cl Even if he climbed all the way up here, the cold will make short work of him. So why have you brought me here? asked Bethesda. Her long, pale arms changed to shackles on the wall. There was a roaring fire in front of her, and the heat was overpowering. Isn't it obvious? I would have thought you were smarter. Haven't you heard of me, Great Ventureth, the Virgin Eater? Yes, I have brought you here because of your youthful beauty and energy. Once I have devoured you, I will obtain the strength that will allow me to defeat Grognak once and for all. Bethesda screamed in horror as the ugly creature opened its beak and started drooling a strange, foul-smelling green liquid that hissed as it came in contact with the ground. Ventureth lunged forward, his wings like a hurricane, and she closed her eyes. A loud whistling sound pierced the cold, damp air of the cave. Gurgling scowns and horrible shrieks followed, and before Bethesda stood none of other than Grognak himself, apparently unaware of the horrible cold outside of the cave and the unbearable heat from the fire, holding up sky fierce, its double edges coated in black blood. The battleaxe had cut off one of Ventura's wings, and it had fallen into the fire, releasing a nauseating stench. Grognak, how did you get in here? he asked furious. I climbed. The tall barbarian prince replied, shrugging as he spun sky fierce, balancing on the balls of his feet as he kept his eyes on the enemy, aware that once the swing of his battle axe had begun, stopping it or slowing it down would be difficult. You have stolen Priestess Bethesda from her home. You have angered the gods, and for that you must pay. 
Ventura shrieked in pain, and his black blood making pulling in the ground, his eagle eyes darting wildly. He tried to spit his acid on Grognak, but he was too fast for him, so he focused his eyes on Bethesda, and with a sudden jump, he landed in front of her and whipped the young woman's stomach with his tail. She gasped and lost consciousness, her head fail falling limply to the side as the lightning bolt tore through the night air. What have you done? thundered Grognak. The gods will kill us all. All hope is lost, replied Vrintureth viciously. You and your people cannot be saved. They will think it was you that slew the priestess. In that knowledge, despair and die. Uh, I know I used to read this when I was younger, or at least the comics, but this is bad. <laughs> A staple of every American home, Guns and Bullets is an easy-to-understand guide to household weaponry. With two in-depth chapters focusing on safety and maintenance, your family will sleep soundly knowing they are safe. Guns and Bullets Extract Chapter 4 On Accuracy Despite what people may think, hunting and target shooting are among the safest of all sports when performed properly. You must constantly stress safety, sight alignment, and trigger control to avoid burning up your supply of ammunition if you aim to become a proficient firearms operator. Something you must always remember is that once you fire your gun, you cannot control where the shot will go or what it will hit. Be aware that, even keeping bullet drop in mind, a 22 bullet can travel over a mile, 1.6 kilometers, whereas shotgun pellets can travel 500 yards, 457 meters. Imagine how far a bullet will travel if it misses your intended target. An essential part of shooting accurately is using the proper ammunition. Using the wrong bullets or pellets can wreck your gun and cause serious personal injury. Be absolutely certain that the ammunition you are using matches the specifications of the firearm. Similarly, do not jeopardize your safety by allowing unqualified persons to repair or modify a gun. It is a mechanical device that requires periodic adjustments, but alterations made by an unskilled individual can make the gun dangerous, inaccurate, and will usually void the warranty. Every time you pull the trigger, focus on your breathing and trigger control. Press it smoothly and firmly. The last thing you want to do is slap the trigger, sliding your finger around it. This will facilitate the firing of follow-up shots when necessary. Remember, it's better to be a tad slow and hit what you are aiming at, rather than be the fastest shot in town and miss the target. You know, they kind of glossed over that the first rule of gun safety is to treat every gun as if it's loaded. A vicious piece written by disgruntled former presidential secretary Alina Weatherby, lying congressional style, criticizes the behavior of American politicians. Names had to be modified before the book could be published. Lying Congressional Style Extract How about some coffee then, my dear Alyssa? I roll my eyes. It has been years since I have been working here, and Mr. I am too important to remember lowly workers' names Nighthawk still can't get it right. I walk to our state-of-the-art kitchen for coffee breaks. The refrigerator is filled with finished vodka, German chocolate, and French cheese. Everything is fine and expensive, and it drives me crazy. As I watch the coffee perk, I sit at the wooden table and look down at the long corridor of shiny white walls. At the end is my workstation. Mr. Nighthawk's office is through the door on my right. The coffee is soon done. I fill two mugs and bring them over. I, however, stop at Mr. Nighthawk's door when I hear him bellowing on the phone. I don't care. Tell those punks that they insist on trying to inflate the prices of those diamond studs. I'll send some of my people their way. That will teach them. But about poor Maria, that sweetheart. It's just her and her daughter sewing the curtains by hand. They're the only ones who would make them exactly as my daughter wants for her wedding. So tell them to take their time. Be gentle. I'm sure that will work better than screaming at them. And give me that file already. It's been over a week. I hear the phone slam on the desk and knock quietly. He tells me to come in. Mr. Nighthawk's spacious office with his large black desk covered with expensive gadgets looks intimidating. Fat, red face, short and sweaty, his sagging jowls and single tuft of blonde hair on top of his head, he makes me nauseous, but I steal myself for his usual string of morning complaints. Aw, oh, sometimes I feel like I'm drowning in a sea of fools. Whenever I need something, I either have to persuade them or force them to do as they should. Why can't things be easier? I leave the mug on the table, and he waves at the chair in front of his desk. I sit down as usual, resenting the fact that my colleagues thought that I was hired, not to manage the more, most important, strictly confidential papers, but to sleep with the boss. He is always coming too close, with that look in his eye that I know to watch out for. 
But dear Alyssa, listen up. Whenever you're reading with a tough customer, just tap into their inherent emotional drives and their important desire to feel important. Convince them there is nothing you'd rather do than listen to them, and you'll see. Or, if nothing works, just toss some threats their way. Look like you mean it, and they'll bend over backwards to do as you ask. Like you did last month? I ask mentally. When that orphanage wouldn't close down for you to build that new five-star statesman hotel, so you sent hired thugs to set fire to the kids' beds? He sips his coffee as he waits for the computers and fax machine to switch on. Well, that's enough of that. Aren't you free this weekend? I thought we could go together to the opera. Hmm, and maybe for dinner afterwards. There are these people I'd like you to meet. Oh, wow, this is such an amazing insight into pre-war America. Ugh, I'm so sorry she had to go through that, though. Nikola Tesla and You is a simplified biography of the Serbian-born and layered naturalized American inventor, listing his early life discoveries and the disheartening conditions of his death impoverished and in debt. Nikola Tesla and You Extract Chapter 9 Nikola Tesla's Peace Ray Truth or Fiction Throughout the years, there have been rumors about a weapon that reportedly had been invented by Tesla in the 1930s, a particle beam gun he'd called the Peace Ray. He pitched his device to various military divisions, and although it was never constructed and the plans were never found, this invention evolved from a pop gun that he used as a boy and that he discusses in his autobiography. The pop gun worked by pumping air into the barrel and causing a cork to come barreling out. The peace ray device was, in theory, capable of generating an intense, targeted beam of energy able to dispose of anything you'd rather didn't exist. Tesla, however, soon realized that a ray would not have the energy to be destructive, as it would disperse over long distances. So Tesla came to the conclusion that instead of shooting a ray of light, he would shoot microscopic pellets made out of tungsten. He used an electrostatic generator to generate tremendous charges through an ionized stream of air, and then used his electrified stream to repel the small pellets and make them shoot out of an open-ended vacuum tube shaped like a cannon. This machine would be able to shoot down incoming enemies at distances of about 300 miles, 482 kilometers. Tesla was unable to find a way to finance the construction of his laser. It isn't even known if he managed to develop a working prototype. At the age of 81, however, he stated, But it is not an experiment. I have built, demonstrated, and used it. Only a little time will pass before I can give it to the world. Huh. I wonder if he ever actually made that. Looking to settle a minor scuffle? The answer is fisticuffs. Whether you are a young child being bullied at school or an adult who just hates that co-worker, Pugilism Illustrated will help you be the best at punching your problems away. Pugilism Illustrated Extract Chapter 2 Basic Techniques Whether it's for glory or in the ring or for self-defense, the popularity of pugilism is still popular throughout the world. It's free, you don't need any fancy gadgets, and it's fair, only you against your opponent, with no unfair advantages. Even now, there are people all over the country providing the pounding the heavy bag at the gym. If you're a beginner, you should only work on three things to start, stance, jabbing, and stamina. First, start by getting the right stance. If your stance isn't rock solid, the first little jab is going to send you stumbling back. Keep your feet positioned, stand on the balls of your feet, and keep your strong foot behind you. For right-handed people, this will be the right foot, and vice versa. Let your opposite foot play the lead, and keep them about 24 to 30 inches, 60 to 76 centimeters apart. The first move you must learn is a straight jab. Keep your fist rested near the, your chest under your chin. The fist should come out turning clockwise about 45 degrees from the chest to its point of impact. It has to be quick. It will keep your opponent's back and can work as a great defense just as much as a potent offense. Now you can stand correctly and throw the most picturesque jab in history, but if you're out of breath after two punches, you're going down. Never fail to focus on your conditioning. Always work on improving your stamina. You should be running laps, doing squats, maybe sign up for sparring lessons. There is a lot more you'll have to learn, but knowing how to stand, how to punch, how to breathe will give you a good chance. Defense, speed, and power will improve as long as you practice often. Well, I guess I could do better with stamina. An unsettling tale of an unknown author, Tales of a Junktown Jerky Vendor, follows the adventures of Wolfgang, a young butcher who has fallen on hard times and must find a way to make ends meet, no matter the cost.
Tales of a Junk Town Jerky Vendor Extract. Willow tossed the hula flowers and skirt at the bed in a temper. She could only smile and pretend things were going just fine for so long. She sat down at her terminal and ran her fingers through her hair. Some journalist she was. She had spent the last six months trying to crack the story, and yet no clue as to what was making all of these people go missing. She was working undercover at the local market of Junk Town, dressed up as a hula girl and playing the ukulele to entertain the patrons of the restaurant who flocked to the place every day to order the jerky special. She didn't even know how to play the ukulele for Pete's sake. She had hastily written the song, Let's Jilt Them With Junk, on the way there once she had found out what she would be posing as, and she was honestly surprised people seemed to like it. But not everything had been bad. She had met a young man, Wolfgang, a local butcher, and they had been seeing each other occasionally. They would talk for hours on end. She had mentioned to him she was short on money, which was true after the newspaper started, getting tired of her taking too long to figure out the story, and was giving her less and less to help every month, and he had gone out of his way to teach her some haggling tricks, which had saved her. Wolfgang himself had been on the brink of homelessness not long ago. She knew now to ask the tailor if that was the best price he could have offered her. The man barely ever had any customers, and he was always eager to make a sale. She would just let him decide the discount first, putting them in a perceived position of power, and she would walk away with a nice deal. When it came to dealing with the weapon dealer, she always paid in cash. In junk town, people had devised a system of barter where they just traded goods or services without money, but she soon saw that the red-headed woman simply loved the feel of coins and bills and was willing to offer her a small cut in exchange for that. Simple pleasures, Willow thought. And of course, once she had gathered enough old bottles and other valuable junk, she'd dump it all at the general supply store, where the nice old man would pay a bit more for bulk sales, probably because he was old and tired, and Willow always brought him a bottle of wine. But enough of that, she thought, as she started up her computer. It was time to write the day's notes. Another two young women had gone missing. She had managed to find pictures of them. She was typing away when she heard the doorbell, but there was nobody outside, just a small letter on the mat. I know a secret you may be interested in, it said, and I think you know one I may be interested in. Meet me at the warehouses tonight and we'll discuss. She dressed up as quickly as she could and left in a rush. This was the chance she had been waiting for. The night was inky black, the lone moon like a silver beacon in the sky. By the time she arrived at the warehouses, she could barely see, having left in such a hurry she hadn't brought her flashlight. The door opened with a blood-curdling creak and she stepped in, noticing a flickering light that told her whoever had sent the letter was waiting for her there. The door slammed shut with an ominous noise. She made her way towards the light and stopped, her heart freezing in her chest. There were slabs of meat hanging from hooks and lying on the tables. There was something unsettling about them. Her eyes wandered until they met a young man wearing an apron, who was busy hacking away with a cleaver, a pool of blood on the ground. He turned around and smiled. Why, hello there, Willow. Nice to meet you here. Wolfgang? What? How? Was it you? Did you send the letter? He nodded absentmindedly as he wiped the knife clean with a cloth. So tell me, darling, who sent you here? What? I came here because you asked me to. He lifted a bloody hand to stop her blabbering. No, no, I mean, who sent you here? I know you are not just an untalented ukulele player. You are a journalist who is trying to investigate those disappearances. Who are you working for? Uh, the Higsbury News. I see. Thank you for telling me this. Wolfgang put the cleaver down and grabbed a smaller, thinner knife from the table. He then approached her, still smiling. So you mentioned there was a secret I may be interested in, Willow asked, her heart suddenly racing. What was that? I'd like to know. Her boyfriend nodded and gently put his hand on her shoulder, playing with a strand of loose hair. She felt a shiver go down her spine. Of course, of course. As you know, I am a butcher, and everybody goes crazy over the jerky I sell. I hunt, I field dress the meat, make the jerky, and offer it all over the town. People love it. Willow's hands went clammy and her eyes started darting wildly. Why are you working here at this hour anyway? It's almost midnight. I like to take my time. The moonlight filtered through a window and a bucket under the table Wolfgang had been working caught Willow's eye. There was something gold inside. Or was it copper? Was it wires? Was it... Her mouth filled with bile as she realized what it was. She had seen it just a couple of hours before, in a picture. It was that missing girl's head. My dear Willow, you see, the jerky is made of people. Then he lunged at her. Willow tried to scream, but her windpipe was no more. This is horrifying. This must be a work of fiction, but the author wrote something that 
is strangely relevant to the post-war world. Tumblr Today is the oldest continuously published monthly magazine for locksmiths in the United States. Its popular column on lockpicking, described as educational only by the authors, means the supplement can be only can only be bought with a special permit. Tumblr Today Extract Lockpicking Digest The Pin Column Model Part 2 Educational Purposes Only as we mentioned before, the pin column model highlights the relationship between the torque applied and the amount of force needed to lift each pin and open the lock. A good way to understand this is to feel the effect of which your torque wrench, which can be anything that you can use to move the lock like a knife or a screwdriver, and the pressure applied by your pick, which again can be anything from a professional steel pick to just a bobby pin and anything in between. Insert your torque wrench carefully into the lock plug and move it around to identify the pins. Once you find one, introduce the pick and apply the pressure. The forces acting on your pick will be the friction from the sides, the spring, the spring contact force from above, and the contact force from the key pins below. All these forces could easily break your pick. The spring force will increase as you push the pins, but the increase is slight, so do not fret. Keep a steady hand, the pins will not move unless you apply enough pressure to overcome the spring force, but the more torque you apply to the plug, the harder it will be to move the pins. When the bottom of the driver pin reaches the end line, the friction binding force drops to zero and the plug rotates slightly until some other pin makes it stop. If needed, repeat the previous process until you have dealt with all the pins, and eventually you will open the lock. This may sound like a lot of work, but practice makes perfect. The only way to learn how to recognize and exploit the defects in a lock is to train as often as you can. Anyone can learn how to open desks and filing cabinet locks, but the ability to open most locks in under 30 seconds is a skill that requires practice. Huh, no wonder this book has been so helpful for me. Angelino Cook, Tim Heidecker, wrote U.S. Army 30 Handy Flamethrower Recipes for Charity, and all proceeds were donated to burn awareness programs. The book, however, was heavily criticized as making fun of the plight of burn victims, and was soon discontinued. U.S. Army 30 Handy Flamethrower Recipes Extract did you know that the United States did not develop a flamethrower until the beginning of World War II? The Kincaid Fire Extinguisher Company was given 90 days to develop one, and as you may expect, it was largely a failure. Their second model, however, called simply M2, was considered the most outstanding flamethrower of World War II, and was used with great success against the Japanese. The basic idea of a flamethrower is to spread fire by launching burning fuel. They can be carried by the operator or mounted on a vehicle. We will use the former in this book. We recommend a two-cylinder system, where a backpack holds one cylinder, with inert propellant gas, usually nitrogen, which pushes the liquid fuel out through a hose, and the other holds flammable liquid. The gun nozzle has an ignition system attached, and when the fuel comes out, it catches on fire and is launched at your target. Easy peasy. Let's put this bad boy to a test, shall we? Here is a simple recipe for you to surprise your loved ones and get acquainted with your new gizmo. Recipe 1. Smoke Roasted Lamb Shanks. In this rookie recipe, we will not apply heat to the meat directly, but rather cook the meat through smoke. It goes wonderfully with mashed pumpkin and hard-boiled eggs. Ingredients. Four lamb shanks, olive oil, coarse salt, and freshly ground black pepper, one cup chicken broth, one cup red wine, four sprigs of fresh rosemary. Preparation. One. Loosely wrap your lamb shanks, previously oiled and dusted with salt and pepper, using aluminum foil. Two. When ready to cook, gather wood and coal on your grill. Then have a go at it with your trusty flamethrower until the wood has burned completely for four to five minutes. Let the fire settle until only smoking embers remain. Three, arrange the lamb shanks in their foil on the grill grate and smoke them for an hour. Pour your broth and wine carefully over each lamb shank and top them with a sprig of rosemary. Four, toss in more wood and coal to increase the temperature using your flamethrower if needed. Continue to cook the lamb until the internal temperature is 180 degrees Fahrenheit, 82 degrees Celsius, which should take from three to four hours. 5. Carefully open the foil packets and transfer the lamb and any accumulated juices to a platter. Enjoy. Didn't they make flamethrowers illegal after World War II because of uh, all the war crimes and stuff? I mean, I guess they are still used domestically. I can definitely see why I haven't found this book before. Alright, well that was really interesting. Let's go look at some of the other exhibits.